Are we on now? There we go. Thank you. So nice to be here. It's wonderful to be here. I was here a couple years ago, and uh, your pastor called me last night and wondered uh, if I would be available today. He was not feeling a bit well, and uh, I said I would ask the Lord what he would have me to share, and I am so pleased with this young lady that just gave a testimony here. It fits right in with what I want to share with you folks today, and uh, I can... I. Uh, Commend her for her, chap, for her effort, and uh, what a beautiful uh, testimony she has given, and uh, we thank the Lord for that. I would like this morning to read just a couple of verses from Scripture. I'd like to read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which as easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance in the race that's set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And I couldn't help but think of what uh, the young lady was uh, saying there uh, as she was talking about her commitment, her joy, what she was experiencing, and I couldn't help but think that she is definitely has already experienced starting the race for the Lord. Uh, and I can see, uh, I can see in her and in, in her message that uh, this is going to be a young, upgoing, outgoing uh, missionary for the Lord, whether it's here in the States or in some faraway country. But I do believe that the Lord has his hand upon you, and I praise you for that. I'd like to share with you, in conjunction with what she has shared, I'd like to share with you this morning, just a, uh, for a few minutes, a little bit about my life and my wife's life. If my, I may introduce my wife, Celia. This is Celia Rice right here. Uh, we have been together for 63 years. I oftentimes take a peek at her uh, standing in the kitchen and I think, I don't believe she has put up with me for 63 <laughs> years. But we've had a wonderful life together. We have three children, we have nine grandchildren, and 15 plus two to come great-grandchildren. And we have been richly blessed, and it's a joy to have them when they all come to our house at Christmas. Uh, we just have such a wonderful time, and we thank the Lord for that. I want to share with you a... Um, a very interesting thought, and I want to ask you a, perhaps a bit of an unusual question. And my question is, <coughs> excuse me, my question is, what would you, uh, what would be your, what would be your two most important tools that you could use for the Lord? What would be your two most uh, important tools that, that uh, you have? And you all have it, I have it, everyone has it. It's just that everyone doesn't use it. Let me share with you, and you think about what you're thinking. Well, you're saying, well, I think this and I think that. But let me share with you maybe what some of you have thought. Possibly some of you have said to yourself, well, one tool that I have is obedience. I am obedient. This young lady has testified of that. The obedience to do what you feel the Lord is calling you to do. No matter your age, that doesn't really matter but you have the tool of obedience. Then you have the tool of faith. You have the faith to believe that what the Lord is asking of you, he will perform through you. Those are the two most important, very fundamental talents or tools that the Lord has given you. And so this morning I'd like to share with you for a few minutes a little bit about our life as missionaries. First of all, we have talked about the element or the tool of faith. It was the first step that we had to take, believing that God was really, really in our lives. This was a long time ago. But we notice in Hebrews 11, 6, <coughs> excuse me, the writer speaks and he says, but without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The two pieces of scripture that I think really lend itself to this idea is all the way back in Genesis 12, 1. Let me turn there, and if you wish to look on your uh, Bible, you're certainly welcome to. But we're looking here in 12, 1 of Genesis, we're looking at the man Abram. 
Abram was a very wealthy man. He was a very contented man. He had a family. He was wealthy. He was, he was happy where he was. He had no intentions of moving out. But then God spoke to him. Notice what it says in chapter 12 of, he, of Genesis, uh, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, now notice what God said to Abram, and Abram was tuned in. And God said, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house. I want you to go to a land, to a land that I will show you, that I will show you. Now, what I want you to notice about that statement is it's implying or alluding to the fact that Abram had no intentions of moving. And when God says, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a land that you're not familiar with. You've never been there, probably never heard of it. But I am going to lead you and I'm going to show you what I want you to do. Now, think about you as Abram. Here you are in Marysville. Been here some of you many years. Some of you young people have been here a number of years. But at any rate, you have no intentions of moving out. And what, what happens here is if you put yourself in Abram's position, you notice that a particular idea may form in your mind. What would I do, <clears throat> what would I do if I sensed, just sensed, not here, but just sensed the call of the Lord on your life? You're content here in the church. It's a great little church, growing, reaching out into the community. You're a part of it. You're going to be a part of it tonight and for the next few nights. You have no intentions of going anywhere. You're content. You're, you're, you're doing well on your farm. You're doing well in your business, whatever you're doing. And yet you feel an uneasiness in your heart, an uneasiness. I personally sense that call, <clears throat> what we call the call of the Lord when I was 11 years old in a church camp. And I sensed from a missionary speaking that God was saying, you, young man, will be a missionary one day. And I accepted that. And I went forth. And I accepted the Lord. And I accepted his call. But then it died out. I had the faith to begin with, but I did not follow through for a number of years. Back in the book of Romans, Paul speaks of, of a situation I want you to pick up on here with me. It's found in chapter 10, verse 14. And this verse became a living part of not only my life, but my dear wife's life. And it reads like this. Paul says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without? a preacher, without a missionary, without a witness. Now, that verse didn't mean a whole lot to me back in those days. That was a long time ago. I just turned 84 years old Friday. And I look back on my life, and I realize it was a long trip. And it went up and down and up and down, the early years of my life. I didn't exactly forget my commitment to the Lord, but I didn't let it be a part of my life. I wasn't all that concerned. Life went on through high school, and then on into college, and then I found my wife uh, at college, and we, uh, after, <clears throat> after a year of courting, we got married. But the strange thing is, people, every year in the Christian Missionary Alliance, every year they would have a missionary convention, and every year I would lean over to my wife, and I, and I would say, Sil, I think maybe I should be a missionary. And the past year would pass, this, the, uh, the week would pass, I would kind of let it go to the wayside. Next year, same thing. Next year, same thing. Finally, my dear wife, and you girls, you young ladies and uh, ladies that are married, been married for a number of years, you'll appreciate this. She took me by the collar, so to speak, and she said to me, now listen, I have heard this all that I want to hear it. Now, either we are going to go to the mission field or you're going to shut up. <laughs> and that was the beginning of one of my tools of having the faith to believe that God had really called me. Now, I didn't hear his voice, but I sensed it in my heart. 
many years before. I was 30 years old at the time. I was teaching school in Delaware. I was enjoying life. We had a beautiful home. We had three wonderful children, 10, 12, 10, and, and five were the ages of the kids. And I thought, why would I want to give this up? Why do I want to give up the position here in Delaware? I'm growing in my profession. I love my profession. And why would I want to leave all this? But I felt strongly, strongly that I had to make that decision. And so consequently, I began to recognize what Paul was saying. If you don't go, how are they going to hear? And if they don't hear, how are they going to come to know the Lord? So that kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And then I started rationalizing. And you all understand that. Began to say to the Lord, now, Lord, listen, I'm 30 years old. I have three children. I have a home. It's a beautiful home. I'm in a profession that I love. Why are you asking me to step out of all of this into the unknown? Abram probably rationalized the same way. So we got to talking about it, talking to our pastor, telling him what we felt was maybe what the Lord wanted us to do. And he said to me and to Celia, listen to your heart. Wait upon the Lord. If the door is closed, stop. But when you get to that door, if that door opens, you better walk through it. And you keep right on walking to every door that the Lord opens. And when finally the door closes, then you know you are right where he wants you. And I thought, this is unreal. And I said, but pastor, I am teaching and I have a very good salary. At that time, it was a very good salary. I said, I have a good salary and a good family. But I am lacking. And this is when I found out I really was lacking. He said, well, why don't you get in touch with the headquarters of the Alliance? <clears throat> up in New York. I said, all right, I'll do that. So I got in touch with the Alliance uh, constituency, and I said, I want to be a missionary. Wonderful. What's your name? Told him my name. How old are you? I'm 30 years old. Oh, oh. And I have three children. Oh, can't have you. Can't have you. The door was closing. Now, in a way, I thought, okay, I'm where I belong. I'm in Delaware, and I'm going to stay here. But then... Along comes the pastor some days later. He said, is the, is the mission telling you, uh, are the people up in New York telling you that you need to go back to school, get your religious uh, education, your Bible studies, get, and learn, go to a seminary, become a missionary, and he'll take care of you? I said, well, possibly. The next thing we knew is we were going up to Philadelphia to meet the dean of students from Crown College, what was then St. Paul Bible College in Minnesota. And he met us at the uh, airport, and in about within an hour, he was shaking our hands and saying, I will see you at, at St. Paul Bible College and Englewood Drive in, in Minneapolis, in uh, St. Paul. We want you as a teacher of zoology, botany, and physiology. But, he said, we will also allow you to go to school while you're serving as an instructor. I thought, sounds pretty odd to me. Long story short, we packed up our gear, put a big for sale sign on the house, told the Lord, we're on our way. We have the faith, and we're going to be obedient, and we're going to go through those doors until you close them. And sure enough, the doors kept opening. We get to Minnesota. We have no job. My, my uh, income at the college was half what I was making in Delaware. I still, I still had the three children and a wife. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you said you would take care of us. You have opened this door for my education, for our education. And so in a given day, on a normal day at the college, on a normal day, I would walk into my office, I would prepare a couple of thoughts, I would head for my classroom, and I would give a lecture. I would conduct a class. 
in one of my disciplines. At the close of that hour, I would quickly close my books, my lecture notes, and I would head down the hall to another classroom. And then I became a student. And this went on for several years. My wife, in the meantime, the Lord blessed her with a job in, a, in an academy, a Christian academy. She couldn't come over to the college and take her work, but she had to have the same kind of work. She had to do her religious education. So I got to talking to some of the other professors, and I said, we've got this little problem. The Lord wants us to do this and that, and we're here, and Celia can't get to college. Well, that's not a problem. Bring a tape recorder. Put it in the class that she wants to take. Record it. I will send home the test with you. Give them to her. Give, she'll give them back. I'll check it. Everything like that. This went on for a couple years. Sure enough, we both finished. We finished, got our degrees, left there, went to New York to seminary. It's a mission seminary called Jaffrey up by West Point. It was there that we found opportunity. The Lord people was so faithful and it generated more and more faith in me, believing, believing that if I use my two tools, one of faith and one of obedience, God would take care of us. Only once, only once in this transition from a lucrative job of teaching in Delaware to being in uh, seminary in New York, only once did we run short of money. Only once. We didn't have an increase in pay. I had no job. She found a job. They, she found a job at a school. She was a, she was a PE teacher. So she had the income. But still, we were one time a little bit short. So she decided to call her sister and said, we're hurting. We need a little bit of money. We need some food. So they sent us a check for a small amount of money, just enough to get us bread and milk and so on, carried us on through, and away we went. Life was great. I then did uh, obtain a job at the Aid Free Church right there in uh, Cresco, New Jersey, and uh, I was serving as a youth pastor. Small income, but it was helpful. So the Lord was providing. How could I deny? The doors were opening, and we were walking through. Completing my studies at the uh, Jaffrey Seminary uh, and, and had the three children. That particular problem was resolved. The uh, headquarters in New York said, well, we know that your kids are ten, 12, 10, and 8, or 5, and uh, that's too many children. You're only allowed to have two, <clears throat> but we'll make an allowance for that. Wow, another door opens. So there we were. We were ready to go. One of the questions that came to my dear wife well, she said to me, you know what? You've been studying in seminary all about the culture in Ecuador, South America. I said, yes, I really want to go there. It's up in the mountains, nice and cool. It's, it's semi-civilized. It's semi I like that. So I was studying, doing all my, all my research on Ecuador. When the phone rang one day, and it was the headquarters, I said, you know, Bob, because you and your wife are both school teachers and have been for a number of years, we need school teachers in West Erion. And I said, where is that? Well, it was an island uh, uh, in Indonesia. I said, I know where Indonesia is. Which island? Well, it's the one, the eastmost part, right above Australia. It looks like a bird, the body of a bird with a long tail, almost touching Australia. I said, well, okay, tell me about it. Don't know too much about it. <clears throat> what you need to do is get in touch with some of the missionaries, and they gave us names. Get in touch with those guys. Find out what it's like, what you need, and what it's going to be like. I said, all right. So we, in, we in, in turn, we got in touch with a couple of the missionaries over there by letter. What came back was frightening, frightening. We're talking about an island <clears throat> filled with people filled with people of a Stone Age culture. Not just talking about it, they were Stone Age people. Then what really caught me was then one of, the, one of the men said in their letter, oh, you probably need to know it's also filled with cannibals. I said, what? 
I said this, you know, I, I think we need to talk to the Lord about this. We're taking three children to an island so far away, halfway around the world, and there's cannibals living there. But we really never felt at ease not to go. So the next question is, you ladies in the house here would say, and would say, well, honey, what are we going to do for food? Oh, they'll have food, I said, trying to be optimistic. We just need to go. All right? So we wrote a letter and said, well, what should we bring? What, what do we need to get us started? And I said, you need to bring enough food, bedding, clothing, all the, all the basics of life with you by plane, send it over an air freight, that will last maybe four to five months. I thought, that's a lot. It's a whole family of three. So we went to the lo local furniture store, and we picked up a large, large carton that holds a free, uh, refrigerator. And we started with friends. We started packing that box full and full and full, clothing and food and everything. And then my wife says, really, you know, it's too much weight to put canned food in. Let's just put some dry food in, like boxes of cereal. Then we'll put some bowls in for the kids, and so on. And so we did this. Wrapped it all up, taped it up good, took it to the airport, and away it went. We never saw it again until we got to the island. And when we got to the island, we were the laughing stock of the group. The missionaries, when we stepped off the plane, the missionary said, ah, there's the couple that sent the dilapidated box with, with cereal spilling out the cracks. It was a mess. But you know the Lord was good. We all got a good joke out of that. We were following the Lord. And think about it, people. We were going to an island where there were cannibals. So that was one of my very first questions to the men and the ladies there when we landed and were getting adjusted and getting to, to know the people. And I remember talking to the guys. And I said, all right, fellas, I want to hear it. What's the story on the cannibal situation? Oh, they live down on the south coast. We're located here in the north coast. Not a problem. I said, mm-hmm. What if I fly to the inside of the island? What if we, what if we, what if we get a chance to go into the, to the villages in, into the middle of the island? Well, you're getting kind of close. But don't worry, don't worry. I'll never forget this statement. They only eat their enemies. <laughs> Dear ones, we were the friendliest missionaries on that island. And we do exist to this day. And they really, really were cannibals. And they really carried out the rituals. And I don't have the time in the day to tell you all about that. It's incredible, incredible. So <clears throat> when we uh, got situated, the first thing they did was they had a feast for us at the school. Great big open building with no, no window. Uh, there were windows, but no glass, just wire. Many benches for the children. There were about 100 children there, MKs and, and UN children. And they were having a big feast for the Rices, the new teachers. And I thought, mm, I'm a very picky eater. I, I really, at that time, I was really picky. And I thought to myself, oh, I gotta try to eat some of this Indonesian food. It doesn't smell very good. A lot of fish, I don't like fish. <laughs> but we went to the dinner that night, and sure enough, there was just plates and plates of Indonesian food. And I don't mind telling you people, it did not smell good. Not to me. Mm -mm. But I managed to suffer down a little bit. What I didn't really like that was on my plate, I kind of shuffled it over to my wife. She'll eat anything. <laughs> anything. And she admits to that. She'll eat anything. So I kind of slide it over to her. We, that, was our intro, that was my introduction to Indonesian food. And then life went on. But you know, it did get better. And I do eat it now, and I enjoy it. I love it. One of the interesting things about being missionaries, and we were missionary teachers, but in the so-called summer months, of course, it was summer all the time there. We were on, you're on the equator. What can you have but summer? 
And being a science teacher, I was teaching the children. And when we would do projects, and we, we did every year, I would do a study with the children. And I'd say, OK, we're going to do a study on temperature variation. 105 degrees average every day of the year. 105. You could literally, and some of the kids for projects, would take an egg, crack it on the cement, and it would fry. And you could eat it. And it was OK. It was hot. Very, very, very hot. Living there was incredible. We had the, the uh, school, the little missionary school, was located on the side of a mountain, 6,000-foot mountain. And interestingly enough, gentlemen, it's where General MacArthur had set his, his, uh, armies, his armies at that spot in an attempt to keep the Japanese army from invading Australia. That was the stopping point of the war for Japan invading Australia. No more. MacArthur stopped. He left behind all kinds of war relics, all kinds of war relics. He left behind all the pads, were the hundreds and hundreds of pads of cement lying among the jungle grass where they had their tents and so on. This is where we were going to live. This was our place. They built us a house. That was nice. It was made from coral block, coral, uh, coral into blocks, and they built us a house, a very nice house. They had Indonesian carpenters who did the work with the advice of the missionary, one of the missionary carpenters. And then my wife said to them one day, and I couldn't believe she said this to them, she said, all right, Gus, you're in charge of this building. Now, here's what I want. I want three bedrooms, a big living room, a good-sized kitchen, and I want a bathtub. And they said, a what? She said, I want a bathtub. There is no such a thing as a bathtub. We would have to pour cement and make a bathtub. I said, that'll be fine. I want a bathtub. And so they did. They convenienced us, built us a bathtub, and it was awesome. Living in a land that was totally Stone Age life. The people, dear ones, the people that we had to adjust to, and we did, and we loved them to pieces, the people, for the most part, were people who had no clothing. That was a shocker. That was a shocker to me. People, the, the ladies, they ran around with little uh, grass rolled up in pig grease into strings, and then they'd make a little, uh, you would call it a bikini. And that was it. That's all they had. Nothing up here. And that was, that was normal. That was no problem because they had to feed their children all the time, and they had to feed their baby pigs all the time. Pigs was a major, major element of wealth among the people. Men would give up their wife before they'd give up their pig. So ladies, think about it. If your husband wakes up and says to you, honey, I really love you today, then you think about what I'm telling you, that you are higher than a pig. <laughs> you are higher than a pig in value, interestingly enough. One of the things that during the so-called summer months, or the months June, July, and August, when we would close the MK school, giving the children a chance to get on the MAF planes and fly back into the interior, where they came from, to their parents, to the mission stations throughout the whole island. They would fly all over the place to their mission stations. And then we would, my wife and I and children, we would always plan ahead and say, all right, during the vacation from school, we will we will uh, get a, a connection with three or four of the missions interior, and we will fly in and spend the rest of our summer, and we will do VBS, we will do preach, I would do preaching, I would go on tracks, whatever the Lord had for us. What an experience. What an experience. I remember once, one summer uh, period of time, we went way to the west end of the island to a mission station, and Ray, the missionary there, said, Bob, I'm going to do something special this week. I said, what are we going to do? He said, you and I are going on a trek. Five-day trek from this station. Your wife can't go, your kids can't, just you and me. I said, sounds good to me. 
So we started, and the day came, and we started flying in, and that was an experience, and I don't have time to tell you all about it, but it was quite an experience. We landed, and then we walked from the grass uh, airstrip, which went up the mountainside, so the airplane would come in, hit the ground, and slide sideways up the mountainside to the plane stop. That was a thrill in itself. Then we, we had a couple of workers uh, went with us, and uh, then we walked over two mountains to get to the out to the out uh, village way deep, very, very close to the cannibal territory. I didn't know that, or I wouldn't have gone. But we were very close. We were there for five days. We slept in a hut on bamboo floor, no pad, just bamboo sticks. We laid on that and slept all night. Our food was what they were eating. It could have been snake. It could have been rats. It could have been just about anything. But they were very generous when knowing that we were going to be leaving that Friday night. So a couple of days or a day or so before, they sent out runners over another mountain to another village, which was a Catholic mission. And they brought back a bag of rice. Dear people, that was like Thanksgiving. That was awesome. And that night, we all Ray and I and all the dignitaries of the village, the chief and all the, as many as could get in that little tiny building. We all crowded in and sat on a, on, on a, um, a type of a bench. It was a log. We sat on the log and we had a log table. And they put banana uh, leaves in front of each one of us. And then all the other people that could possibly get in that little room came in. And it was so hot, so hot, so many bodies. And then I, Ray kept saying to me, Bob, oh, something really, really smells in here. I said, I know it does. It's making me sick to my stomach. And then finally a little girl, one of the little, one of the little native girls, went behind a bamboo partition. And she walked back into the little area where we were, right where the table was. And she had this banana, banana uh, leaf box woven into a box. And she set it down on the table right across from where I was sitting. And the chief, who was the, bo who was the boss, he gets his hand and he sticks it down in the box. And shl 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 shl, a lot of juice, a lot of juice. And pretty soon he's pulling this out. And in our Petromax lamp, which we had brought with us, I could see what it was. And Ray said, I think we found our smell. I said, I know we found our smell. He said, what do you think it is? I said, I know what it is. That is a fruit bat, and it has been around a while. So he said, he said to the chiefs in, in their language, he said, uh, how long have you had this bat? Oh, he didn't know, probably three months. But he said, we don't think it's quite ready yet. I said, not ready yet. And in the meantime, they're tearing it apart, putting pieces on each person's banana leaf. And I was next. When suddenly he said, I think it's not ready. And I said, oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I didn't have to eat that. It was terrible. So they collected all the pieces, put it back in the box, took the box away, and we went on and had a wonderful evening of rice. Man, I tell you, that rice tasted as good as any turkey my wife ever cooked. It was awesome. It was just awesome. So that was a sort of, that was just one of many, many unusual experiences that we had, that uh, Sylvia and I had uh, in Erie and Jaya, in the, what is now Erie and Jaya today. It's actually, they changed the name periodically. It is now known as uh, Papua, Papua. It used to be Dutch New Guinea many, many years ago under the Dutch, but now it's just Papua under the influence of the Indonesian government. I remember... I remember so well one incident. Our very first trip from the north coast where the compound was, they flew us over the mountains, 17,000 foot mountains, and dropped us down into a valley called the Balim Valley. Beautiful big valley, huge. And I remember when the plane taxied up the grass uh, landing area, there were lines of natives, men, women, and children, just lining the entire runway. And I'm gawking at these people. I just could not believe. 
men standing there with these, these bones sticking out of their nose, their earlobes hanging way down here, uh, with great big holes in the earlobes. I mean, an incredible sight, just incredible sight. We got out of the airplane, and I no more than stepped away from the plane, and out of the crowd comes this young man, probably in the neighborhood of late teens maybe, but he was built like a football player. And he come, he come running over to me, and he grabbed me, and he started jumping up and down, and he was holding me really tight, and we were jumping up, so I had to jump with him. We were jumping up and down, and he was just talking in his language, but I had not a clue what he was saying. But he was so happy to see me. Finally, he let me loose, and I stepped back, and I looked down, and I was pig grease from here to my feet. Pig grease. That's how they bathe. They're afraid of water. So every year when they would have a pig feast, they would take off all the grease, and then they would store it. Then when they needed a bath, they'd just take the grease, and they'd just grease themselves, get the mud off. And then when he hugged me and stepped back, I was covered with pig grease. But I loved it. I had adjusted. It was awesome. Many, many, many stories like that. It was incredible. Probably, and I need to close here, but probably one of the most traumatic, one of the most traumatic changes, one of the most traumatic situations that Celia and I both had to endure was when our oldest girl, who now we've been there several years, she finished and the school only went to eight grades. Then she had to leave uh, where we were over on the farmost province she had to fly from there across all the islands all the way up to Singapore, 3,000 miles. She would fly. And 13 other MKs, all heading for ninth grade at the Lot School. The trauma was to say goodbye to our daughter, who was going to be leaving us. We would not be able to see her, not until Christmas. This was in August, early August. She would leave. She would return at Christmas. At Christmas, she would be with us a couple weeks, back on the plane, and back up to Dalat, back up to Singapore, not to be seen again until June. That was traumatic. That was an adjustment, and I learned later from my dear wife that this was the one, one thing, one situation she really wrestled with God. How do I give up my children? How will I do that? And the Lord was good. And in all three cases, when it came time for them to leave where we were, and they would fly up there, that was fine. We were able to adjust. We realized this was God's will. This was our tool of obedience. We had to be obedient to the Lord. So, dear people, no matter what your age, and especially you young people, you may not hear the voice of God. You may not hear that voice. But you may sense in your heart, or you may be, as this young lady was, put in a situation at a camp where you feel the moving of the Spirit. And you have a sense that maybe I should be one to leave, just as Abram did. Go to a land that you don't even know where it is, but I will show you, and I will bless you. And dear ones, the Lord has blessed my wife and I richly. We were there for 10 years. Many, 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 many experiences. All sometimes, at the moment, I had a hard time with it, but now I look back and I think, what a blessing. God will take care of you. If it's the Lord's will, keep going through that door, keep going until it closes and does not open, then you're right where he wants you. And that is so important, so very important. Abram packed up his gear, his family and all, and they headed off. And he was blessed because God said he would bless him. If you don't go, they will not hear. If they don't hear, they cannot accept the Lord, for they know not the Lord. These dear people in Dutch New Guinea, or what we call uh, Papua today, I talked with many of them around the campfires, around their huts, and I asked him, what did you think was outside these mountains? Because they never have crossed the mountains. They've never been to the north. 
They won't go to the south because that's where the cannibals were. So they lived in this valley all of their life. I said, when you look up in the sky, what do you see? Don't you see big airplanes going over? All oh, the old timers would say, yeah, we just thought it was some kind of a big bird. We didn't understand it. It didn't really matter. These dear people are now building indigenous churches. God's word is going forth with the missionaries that are still there. They are developing many, many dear ones. No longer do they wear the, the greasy bikini on the ladies. They now wear shirts. The boys wear shorts that the missionaries give them. Uh, I know I gave up a lot of my clothes, but not until I'd worn them until the year wore out, but that was okay with them. They wanted the American clothes. They wanted to show, I know Jesus. And they live for Jesus. They're being educated in Christ, and it's wonderful. Be mindful. Don't turn your heart off. Listen. Listen carefully. The Lord will speak to you in so many different ways. The Lord is so faithful. You be faithful to him. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege that you have given to me and to Celia to be here at this church, to share just briefly what you have done in our lives and you continue to do in our lives. You have brought us home and you have given us a position at the church at Berean and Lincoln to serve you, to serve older people, people our age and some older. What a, what a privilege you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. I ask your blessing upon this congregation, this community of believers. I ask your blessing upon these young people, and especially this young girl. Guide her, direct her, minister to her, show her your will, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.